Hi there, I'm Darren Parkinson. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about some Cisco APIs. Uh, it's quite a long title and we've got about 20 minutes to get through that. So uh, we'll, we'll see how we get on. And uh, if you've got any questions about the presentation, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Darren Parkinson. Uh, so just before I start, a little bit about me in terms of uh, where I'm from. So I'm, uh, I'm part of the team at Natalik, part of their DevOps team, um, working on the Cisco APIs. I predominantly focus on the collaboration APIs, uh, but we're finding a lot of benefit comes from um, putting all the different APIs from the different platforms together. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is using chatbots uh, to uh, add functionality and give people capabilities uh, inside WebEx teams so that they can uh, go about their day and, and, uh, and be more productive. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about WebEx Teams, why we use WebEx Teams, and specifically business messaging um, quite a lot for a user interface. And then I'm going to show you three uh, quick integrations, one with Communications Manager, some Meraki integrations, and then a little bit with CMX and DNA Spaces, and really just hopefully inspire you to, to perhaps think about your own situation and how you might uh, use chatbots in, in your environment. Uh, so just by way of background, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why we use chatbots quite extensively. Um, and the main reason really, it just falls into these categories, which is that we had uh, a bunch of mobile apps that we had for different platforms, and they were becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to maintain. Uh, and also just putting those applications into people's hands just is, uh, is quite challenging. And if we then wanted to add new functionality, we found that uh, it, it took just too long to give people new pieces of functionality. And also, if it was a small piece of functionality, you know, where do we put it? Which app does it go in and that kind of thing? So it just became a little bit more, more difficult and tricky as, as time went on. Uh, and then I think people are also getting more used to uh, conversational user interfaces. So we've got our little uh, home assistants, who I won't name, uh, that uh, do a lot of things. So we're just really becoming a lot more used to that interface. And from a portability perspective, we're seeing those interfaces migrate into lots of new places. So uh, we're seeing it in cars now. Uh, and we're also seeing it with WebEx Teams, so with WebEx Assistant uh, and WebEx. Uh, you know, we're seeing those those um, chat assistants uh, and natural language processing in, in those environments. And the identity is there really just to to sort of say, you know, we've, if you're using WebEx Teams and a chatbot, you're already authenticated. So it's uh, you know we don't have to build that into every piece of functionality you want to uh, to, to deliver to users. Uh, and that's really backed up by some information that uh, that we've got here, which is around how you know we can see seventy two percent of people use fewer than seven apps a day. So most people are only using between four and six apps a day. Uh, and so what that really means is, if you want to deliver functionality and give people uh, applications in their hand, then uh, delivering that through a new app is is quite challenging just because people are not going to download those apps. Uh, they probably won't open them because they have their existing four or six apps that they're using. Uh, and so the best thing to do is actually deliver the functionality in the places that people are spending their time already. Uh, and what we found again is that, of course, it goes without saying that messaging and social apps are probably the biggest growth area in terms of the apps where people are spending their time. So you think about things like Facebook Messenger and those kind of things. Um, so with chatbots, of course, we're able to provide that uh, functionality in the place that people are spending their time already. Um, and uh, and just deliver that functionality where they're already at. So, uh, and then uh, the next piece really was just another thing that we thought about in terms of something that we found was that people were wasting a lot of time searching for meeting rooms, and I think that's compounded now where people are now having to book hot desks uh, at the moment. So, uh, again, people just trying to find places to work and and those kind of things. So, just making sure that we're able to provide functionality to users and just making them as as efficient as they can be. So we obviously deliver a lot of different functionality uh, to users through chatbots. But one of the things that's super important is that we monitor the, the user adoption. So uh, we have uh, 32, it's probably more than that now, but we have around 32 intents in this particular chatbot. Uh, um, but you can see there that 81% of the questions come from those top five intents. So uh, it's just really important to monitor that to make sure that you're spending time in the right areas and delivering the right kind of functionality to users and the functionality that they want as well. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So just in terms of some example integrations, uh, our chatbot, which is called Natbot for Natilic and Bot, uh, so it won't, uh, it's not very inspiring, but um, it, uh, it, it's quite heavily used and, uh, and we have four different areas really, really where we're providing functionality. So uh, from a user point of view, we can uh, unlock accounts and we can reset devices and lock tickets and all those kind of things as you'd expect. 
Uh, and then for our customers, we can look up the, the details for the team that looks after that customer. We can look at uh, the ETAs for equipment deliveries and support tickets. And then for our people, uh, this is an interesting one where we have a legacy application where holiday information is stored uh, and they have no other way of exposing that on their mobile device. So we're able to take that information um, we're able to take that information from uh, from that legacy application and deliver that through WebEx Teams uh, in the application. Uh, and then we've got the who is and where is functionality there, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second. And the final area is actually transport. So from a transport point of view, we were already using these APIs for dashboards around the office. And so uh, we just sort of added those uh, as a matter of course to our, to our chatbot. So what I'll do now is I'll, um, hopefully I've, uh, I've sort of explained how we use chatbots and why we use chatbots and uh, and now go into perhaps the, the detail in terms of some of those features that, that we added. So this first one was a feature we added a really long time ago before adaptive cards was a thing in, uh, in chatbots. So um, it's basically just using a fairly simple natural language engine uh, to set single number reach on communications manager. So what we're doing here is we're just asking to set or disable my single number reach, which Historically, it was very useful if I'd left the office already and I just needed to turn that on or off. And, and to deliver that, we're just using these two simple features, list remote destination and update remote destination. Uh, and if we look at the Cisco documentation for that, which the link was on the previous slide, um, it looks a little bit antiquated and it's it's basically, um, it's based on XML and that's either a good or a bad thing depending on your perspective. But on the left, you can see the, um, the list remote destination and on the right is the update. And it, until you get into it, it can seem quite confusing. But essentially, all that's really saying is that we need to specify search criteria in terms of looking up the uh, the destination. And then we need to specify the, the pieces of information that we want to get back. And actually, if you click on those and click through, it gives you a lot more detail around what those return tags are and what you can use in, in, the, in the responses. So in terms of what that looks like from an XML perspective, very simple. We just have this template. We can replace the username uh, for the person with, that we're searching for, and that will then return a bunch of information, which we can then use to set uh, set the remote destination. So here you can see us updating that remote destination, uh, and we're just using the UUID that we had previously, and then we have the destination, of course, and then a Boolean value to, to determine whether we're going to enable or disable that single number each functionality. Uh, so we can use the exact same piece of uh, XML there to do to do both tasks. Uh, and it's really as simple as that. So a really simple piece of functionality that was super useful to people uh, and hopefully just uh, get you thinking about the kinds of things you could do where you're having users having challenges and you can just deliver these simple pieces of functionality to, to help them out. Um, and the next one I wanted to talk about was, um, was this one, which is kind of like our corporate directory where we can look up users. So you can see on the right of the slide there, uh, I, can, I can search for Mike and it will give me all the details about Mike. Uh, and two interesting pieces of information on there really are probably the location. So that location information is coming real time from our Cisco CMX platform. And we're able to see whereabouts in the building Mike is at, at any, any moment in time. Um, and we users basically said, well, that's great. I can see where he is, but I don't actually know if he's free or not. So before I go and hunt him down and uh, you know try and find him so that we can have a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, perhaps I need to know when he's available. So we then took that information from Microsoft Graph to present when he's busy until as well. So, um, and uh, if we go into the CMX API that we're using for that, uh, I actually also show the REST API for DNA spaces as well, because uh, whilst we currently use CMX for the location services, uh, we are migrating that over to DNA spaces and the exact same functionality is available in both. So if you have one or the other, you'll still be able to do this kind of, uh, this kind of lookup. Um, so we're using the CMX mobility services in this case. It's using this active clients v3 endpoint. Uh, and what that, uh, oh, and the DNA spaces one actually is very similar. You can see here, it's just using this active clients endpoint. So again, it's just slash clients. Uh, so the way this particular API that we wrote for this um, is using a, a language, programming language called Go. I don't know if you've ever programmed in uh, Go before. It's a really nice language. If you're familiar with Python, then it wouldn't be too dissimilar. Um, uh, to get going with, with Go. It's a really nice language to program in. But uh, here you can see at the top of the slide, that's the, the request I'm making to get all the CMX clients. And below that is the function that, that makes that, that request up. So you can see in there, I'm really just uh, making a decision about what the URL looks like, uh, depending on whether you passed in a zone or not to, to look up. 
Uh, and then we're doing a simple get request using basic authentication uh, authorization uh, to, to make that look up from, uh, from CMX. So that's a library, uh, the app.cmx is a library that we created. I'm hoping to put that on, um, on Dendit uh, Code Exchange at some point. So uh, uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. But in terms of what that delivers, that essentially delivers a, delivers a huge JSON uh, object, uh, which contains lots of information. But the two pieces of information we're interested in are the location, of course, and then the MAC address. Uh, so we, whilst we have a MAC address, at the moment in our system, we don't have any way of identifying uh, the user um, that goes along with that MAC address. Uh, and it, and it's, it's the same with DNA spaces at the moment as well. So we get the exact same information. It's slightly different. We get MAC address and hierarchy there. Um, but essentially, I have the same issue in that I don't get a username that I can use to, to tie that MAC address to the person. So for that, we actually have a great, a great solution for that in the sense that we use Meraki for our uh, device management. And so Meraki has a list of our MAC addresses and it has a list of associations of those MAC addresses to, to devices, uh, to people. So what we can then do is we can take the information from CMX or DNA spaces, we can uh, tie that up with the information that we're getting from Meraki about our devices, and then we can deliver the kind of functionality that you can see there in the chatbot very easily. So from Meraki point of view, uh, it's very similar. We've got a, a Meraki library that we've created, uh, and again, using Go uh, to, to make that request. The main difference here really is the type of authorization that's being used. So you can see here we're using a Meraki API key in the header, um, as opposed to the basic authentication for um, and that's just the way that uh, that, that works. And actually, uh, interestingly, uh, the REST API for DNA spaces uses, um, it does use the authorization header, but it does use an API key for that authorization header. So three different ways of doing authentication, which is pretty pretty common. Um, but, but essentially, again, we're just making that request, getting out the details, and then decoding those into, uh, into a Go object, if you like. Uh, and the data that we get back from that, as you can see here, is uh, we're getting a MAC address, and that's what we're using to tie the two pieces of information together. And then we have the owner email and the owner username, uh, which we can then use to determine a bit more information about that person. So given that we know where I am in the office, and given we know where Mike is in the office, we can then uh, do some wayfinding. So what we have there is um, we've integrated with a partner called MazeMap, uh, and they essentially provide mapping for our office space and route finding, all those kind of things. So we're able to tie that in, use their APIs to uh, to deliver a bit of wayfinding. So I can sort of find where somebody is, and then I can find directions to that person, and then get a map with, uh, with with route finding. Now we don't have a huge office there, as you can see in that particular location, but hopefully uh, it um, you can you can see where you, where that'd be useful. So the next thing I wanted to talk about really was just well, how is that? information actually delivered to the user inside WebEx Teams. So for that, um, if you go to uh, developer.webex.com, you can get a lot of information there in terms of developing for WebEx Teams. Uh, and it's super easy to do. Uh, and in this case, what we're using is we're using something called adaptive cards to deliver that content in that nice card format with a photo and the nice formatted text and so on. So in this instance, I'm using the adaptive cards library, which allows us to programmatically set all those values on the card. Um, but also there is the capability to use some newer adaptive cards templating. So what you do there is you essentially start with uh, with a JSON document and then you just replace values in that in that template. Um, so if you've ever used any sort of ginger templating or anything like that, you'll be familiar with that. Uh, on the right, actually, you can see this is a different chatbot that we use for booking our uh, hot desks now. Uh, so now that we're sort of slowly going back to the office, we're, we're actually booking uh, booking hot desks and so on. And you can see that we've integrated the mapping capability there as well. So we can um, we can see where those desks are inside the office. Um, so yeah, on the left, you can see then the code that, that creates that, uh, that the, the data that we need for that template. And then the actual template is very simple in terms of uh, the adaptive card structure that we use, uh, where we're then just adding that data in. So adaptive cards, I forgot to mention, are super useful if you want to do cross-platform chatbots as well, because Adaptive cards can be used in a variety of different uh, applications and, and, and messaging applications. So uh, really useful for that. Um, so then the next step that we've been looking at more recently is this kind of idea of a smart kiosk. And, and the idea there is that uh, when you turn up to our office, um, we have a little Meraki camera that sort of, you, you know, we can see you arrive. Uh, and then we can use that Meraki camera potentially to do some face detection uh, and then some face, we can apply some face recognition to that. 
And then once we've got that and we know who you are, we can then start doing things like the wayfinding and, and, and directing you to your desk. Uh, we can sort of find find people that you work with and whereabouts they are in the office so that you then know where everybody else is in the office rather than kind of aimlessly wandering around looking for them. Um, and then we can do things like guest check-in and also the zero touch experience. So if we're doing face recognition, we can we can make sure that we're having a zero touch experience. Um, uh, so you're not, you know, you're keeping safe when you're, when you're in the office. So if we look at the first part of that, uh, and I'll only do the first part in this particular slide, which is the um, Meraki camera. So I've been recently experimenting with that. I've got a colleague in the office, Matthias, who's been playing around with this quite extensively. So he's done a lot of work uh, around getting, you know, face recognition working with masks and without masks and, and, and mask detection and those kind of things. And um, uh, so I've been taking a look at that as well. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about Meraki cameras is that they have a whole heap of functionality already built into them. So actually they already do people and object detection and, um, and people counting as well. So they have um, the ability to log all of that information to an MQTT broker. So you just set up an MQTT broker and you can get a constant stream of the information coming from the camera about how many people are in the view and, uh, and those kind of things. But if you wanted to take that to the next step where you wanted to apply your own machine learning or artificial intelligence to that stream, uh, recently, I think it was in April or May, um, the Cisco released RTSP streams on your Meraki cameras. So if you have access to that Meraki camera on your network, you're able to connect directly to that RTSP stream. And you can then, as you can see in this piece of Python code here, I've just applied a, a cascade classifier to that, and that will do face detection. So I can work out you know, that, that it's a person and it's a face, which we can then send to um, face recognition, for example, to then identify who that person is. And we've successfully done that. So the picture there on the right actually is from a Meraki camera. Uh, and on the right of the screen, just outside of shot, is a, is a kiosk that we've sort of put together with um, a camera, which is taking your, a, a shot of your face and it's identifying you and then just uh, detecting your temperature as well and just checking to make sure that you're okay uh, to go in the office. Um, so lots of things there. We've talked about sort of uh, Meraki cameras and we've talked about uh, Meraki systems manager devices and uh, we talked about REST APIs for uh, DNA spaces and CMX and, uh, and WebEx Teams as well. So uh, the key thing that brings all these things together, of course, is the chatbot. Um, and from a design point of view, I think the important thing is just to say, you know, just establish your goals early uh, and just, just think about the kind of functionality you want your bot to have. Because one of the challenges we've had of growing this organically is that, um, you know, we've had a bit of overlap in terms of the, the language and, uh, and the domains, uh, domain specific language that, uh, that you might use for asking questions. Uh, so just make sure you sort of plan it well up front. Um, but be, be brief, you know, bear in mind, people are going to be using these things on their mobile devices potentially, um, and they can easily be interrupted by a phone call or something else. So you just need to make sure that you're not kind of hanging around and expecting that conversation to continue. Uh, and don't make any assumptions about how the user is going to use it and what kind of questions they're going to ask. You know, really do some research into that. Uh, and also don't uh, assume they can spell or type as well. So uh, depending on your uh, natural language processing engine will depend on whether that's handled for you or whether you have to manage that yourself. But essentially, just continually optimize the, the service to make sure that users are really getting the best experience they can. So you can see here we have a little card here where if somebody um, somebody doesn't uh, answer it doesn't answer the question properly, then we can sort of see that and we can just add that into our into our natural language processing. Um, but similarly, you might want to escalate that to a real life agent or something like that in a contact center potentially or or to your IT help desk or something like that. So just make sure you're failing gracefully. And then the final point there is just it's not um, or all these other tools you're already delivering to your users, it's as well as. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, you know, we also have web applications and those kind of things that deliver much richer functionality. So you can escalate the chatbot to those those platforms, but but do it as well as those to give people more flexibility while they're on, on the go and on their mobile devices. Uh, so that's um, really it. Um, I guess my final slide is really, if you're into using APIs, then the, the last API you might use is to uh, perhaps uh, look at uh, some open uh, positions that we have available. So if you're looking to... Uh, move on uh, certainly look us up and, uh, and take a look uh, and that's really it for me so again just um, if you have any questions about the presentation uh, feel free just to uh, message me on on twitter at darren parkinson uh, and then all that's left for me to say is just i hope you are enjoying devnet create and continue to enjoy the rest of it thanks very much <laughs>